Hello everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Maximizing Microscopy Output in Cell Biology, a practical guide to high content imaging and analysis presented by Dr. Nicholas Dolman, PhD. We are excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more about Thermo Fisher Scientific, please visit www.thermofisher.com. Thermo Fisher Scientific Incorporated is the world leader in serving science with revenues of $17 billion and approximately 50,000 employees in 50 countries. Our mission is to enable our customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. We help our customers accelerate life sciences research, solve complex analytical challenges, improve patient diagnostics, and increase laboratory productivity. Through our premier brands, Thermo Scientific, Applied Biosystems, Invitrogen, Fisher Scientific, and Unity Lab Services, we offer an unmatched combination of innovative technologies, purchasing convenience, and comprehensive support. I'm Brenda Kelly Kim of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the broadcast. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as time permits at the end of this presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge this window, just click on the screen icon located in the lower right. Finally, if you have any trouble seeing or viewing, hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Nick Dolman. Nick received his PhD from the Department of Physiology at the University of Liverpool and created a and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the NIH. Nick has been with Thermo Fisher Scientific for seven years and is currently a senior staff scientist in research and development. He has led the development over, of over 50 products that cover a diverse range of technology platforms, including fluorescent protein-based biosensors, in vitro gen clicket chemistry, and environmentally sensitive dyes. We will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Dolman. Thank you all very much for joining us today. I hope you find the following presentation useful as we start to look at a few practical considerations uh, for employing high content imaging and analysis. So to look at what we're actually going to go through today, I'm just going to break the seminar down into a, small, a few small parts for you. First of all, we're going to look at the advantages of using high content imaging and analysis. We'll then actually look at how the images are acquired and how we do the analysis. This is really where the advantages of high content imaging uh, and analysis come in, and so we're going to spend a fair amount of time going through this. We'll then finish off just to show you a few examples of how we can use high content imaging and analysis to answer some very pertinent biological questions. But before we go on, let's take a step back and actually think about why we might use fluorescence microscopy itself. Well, fluorescence microscopy, like any microscope, allows you to study a cell in its intact setting. Indeed, we can do live cell imaging, and then a cell is alive and moving around and functioning as normal. What fluorescence gives us is contrast. We get enhanced sensitivity. We can really start to see some of these structures and functions occurring within cells with improved resolution. And of course, using fluorescence, we can actually tag certain proteins, either using fluorescent proteins or indeed antibodies, and use that to tell where those proteins are, or as markers of certain structures or indeed certain processes. And because of the properties of fluorescence, we can look at more than one protein at once, so we can look at more than one structure or more than one process within that cell. So we can look at where those molecules are in space, how that changes over time, and indeed what may be co-localizing with those proteins. So we do see a lot of pros of using fluorescence microscopy. However, some of the drawbacks in terms of their throughput and the quantification. It can be rather time consuming to acquire a lot of images and then to bring them into quantification software to derive numbers. Because as nice as the pictures and images we are, that we get from the microscope are, without quantification, uh, they're really not much use to us uh, to answer biological questions. 
So how do we address those drawbacks of throughput and quantification? Well, we're not doing very much different. You know, we're starting with essentially a regular fluorescence microscope. However, it does look a little bit different. We tend to package it up in a box, okay? But the same thing that you do with a standard microscope, you do with a high content image uh, box. We take an image. However, with high content imaging and analysis, we don't just stop at one. The system will then take another field and another and another. So here the automated acquisition starts to come into play. We're able to gather a large number of cells from a very, very short uh, imaging protocol. Of course, because we're using fluorescence, we can use multiple emission filters and get more channels. We're not limited to two or three or four. We can get many and build up a very uh, in-depth picture of what the, uh, the spatial and temporal distribution of molecules are within cells. More often than not, we're using multi-well plates. These can be 96-well plates or 384-well plates. However, it is important to note that we can also image regular glass bottom and petri dishes as well as um, cover slips and slides. However, what wells uh, within those plates give you is the ability to do multiple replicates if you're looking at um, concentrations of various compounds, or if you're looking at libraries, you're able to look at a large number of genes, for example, in an siRNA library, or a large number of compounds within a small molecule library. This gives us this rapid and unbiased acquisition of a large number of cells, and we'll talk a little bit about why that's important later on. Uh, we'll look at the relevant and robust view of the heterogeneity within the population as well, because you're sampling such a large number of cells. So how do we actually acquire these images? Well, it's very important to get the acquisition right, because they're the basis for all the downstream analysis. We start with our acquisition box. Essentially, we have the ability, like with a regular microscope, to do a number of different image acquisition um, setups. We can look at different objective lenses from 4x right up to 60x. And it, depending on what you want to do, you will select different objective lenses. If you need speed and you, you're not so concerned with subcellular resolution, you can go down to uh, lower magnifications. As you start to want to capture more detailed processes within, within cells, you may want to go up in uh, objective lens magnification, 20, 40, or even up to 60x. Just like with, other, with regular microscopes, we can acquire images in wide field or confocal mode. And of course, confocal has a number of advantages. It improves your axial resolution so we can get crisper images. It's especially important when we're looking at uh, complex three-dimensional structures. Here's a comparison of a wide field and a confocal image for an embryonic body stained with anta beta 3 tubulin. And this is very important as we start to do the segmentation and identification of objects. You can see the improved object identification with confocal versus wide field here in this maximum projection from Whitefield or confocal image. We can also do colorimetric, so we aren't just limited to fluorescence imaging either. Here's an H&E stained tissue section. We've also co-stained with an antibody against a proliferative marker, KI67, detecting the DAB, and we're asking the software to segment and recognize those KI67 positive cells within the H&E stained tissue. So we aren't just limited to fluorescence either. We can also se uh, select a number of different fluorescent channels, and this gives you the ability to look at multiple molecules within the same cells. And uh, just like on, on regular inverted systems, we can also do time-lapse imaging. Here's an example using our Fuchs cell cycle sensor. This is a cell cycle sensor that changes color as the cells progress through the cell cycle, and we're able to look at cells over time. Uh, depicted on the bottom is frame number, and we can see their progression through the cell cycle. So we aren't limited to static images, we can do time-lapse imaging as well. When we think about the analysis, it's important to consider when we're actually going to set this up. We're still looking at the same configurations for, for image acquisition, but we do need to think about what our cells are doing. If we're using fixed cells or living cells that, are, that have a stable reporter in them, uh, or, or, or the processes won't be changing much over the course of time in which we'll be acquiring the data, we're actually okay to set up the analysis prior to the scan. So we'll go in and we'll segment cells, identify objects prior to actually scanning the plate using uh, just a few images, representative images taken from the plate. However, if we're doing time-lapse imaging or if we've got very sensitive reporters that might be changing very rapidly, what we can do is actually acquire the images in acquire only. We then go back and do a disk scan. This is essentially when we take the acquired images from our hard disk and we reanalyze them. We call this a disk-based scan and it's a way of speeding up your acquisition times. When we think about the acquisition itself, we essentially have three steps. First of all, we just acquire those images. And uh, if we're doing the analysis setup prior to plate scan, 
we'll often look, uh, acquire the positive and negative control images. Here's an example of proliferating cells labeled with our clicket assay, clicket plus EDU. Uh, this tells us which cells are synthesizing DNA and so are in S phase. And here we have on the left control versus on the right, these cells have been tre treated with a mitotic blocker. So they haven't exited the cell um, mitosis. They're not able to enter S phase, which is why we don't see any green nuclei. Once those images are acquired, we import them into the reference manager. Uh, essentially, we can compare those min and max images, and from there we can start to build the segmentation for subsequent analysis. We can do image adjustment here. Of course, we're limited to linear adjustments. One should never do a nonlinear adjustment to any image. But we can improve the brightness and contrast, and we can remove background to get better uh, identification of those um, cells. From there, we can start to do object identification. This is when the software actually picks up what a cell is, and from there can build up all the subsequent downstream uh, analysis portions within the cell. Um, I show you examples by and large using nuclear segmentation, and oftentimes we'll use dyes such as Herxt or DAPI. These uh, emit in the blue channels, and they're very, very bright, and they're very good for cellular segmentation. Of course, you can label up the whole cell. Uh, the image on the top right there, um, that is an example where we've used a cell mask, and this labels the whole cell, and so we can uh, better segment the entire cellular area. So once we have those images, we've identified the cells, we can then go in and do identification in the second channel. Uh, this is the channel that often um, contain the, the, the reporter of interest. So here we're looking to identify cells that are positive for clicked EDU, which means we're looking at percent responders for proliferative index. And once we have those cells identified, we can start to look at all sorts of quantitative parameters. We can look at how the, the histograms fall for certain intensities. Uh, we can look at their spread as a function of any number of other cellular parameters. And from there, we can start to gate and say which ones we want to view as being responders, so counted as positive. Of course, we can actually visualize all of the cells. Here, we just have some cells labeled with DAPI. What you see here are characteristic cell cycle distributions of DNA dice. Sorry, I'm just going to go back to that slide, if I may, and, and, and highlight those for you. Uh, here we have our 2N population. Here we have our 4N population. And here we, up here, we have our super 4N. So we can actually see that borne out with the images. We have greater DNA dye concentrations in the cells that are, have, have synthesized DNA prior to mitosis, whereas these have way more so they're not really part of the cell cycle. And again, we can do this for any number of different reporters in any channels. We can actually visualize the cells and do a sort of pre-acquisition QC, make sure we're seeing what we think we should be seeing. I'm actually going to show you now an example assay to further highlight how the software is able to identify cells and then look at objects within those cells. We're going to use an assay close to my heart, the autophagy assay. We're using our Cell Insight CX-5 high content screening platform. We have A549 cells, so a lung cancer cell line. We've labeled the nuclei with Herx33342, and this is the report that's going to allow us to identify cells. And then we're looking at autophagosomal presence with an antibody against the uh, autophagosomal marker LC3B, and we'll be picking that up with an Lexaflor 488 conjugated secondary antibody. Here are the images in their entirety. You can see Herx channel here, LC3B staining here, and then the overlay on the right. So we're seeing the, the presence of the cells on the left, and then the presence of autophagosomes within those cells in the middle, and how they overlay together on the right. So once the software has acquired the image of the nuclei, the software will then uh, segment and say which cells are, 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 prop, tr are truly cells, or which nuclei, sorry, are truly cells, and which are too small and shouldn't be viewed as being truly cellular. We then acquire an image in the green channel from the Alexafluor 488, which is, of course, showing us autophagosomes. From there, we then segment the cells. We overlay that segmentation, the circle that's built from the nuclei with a ring out into the cytoplasm, and from there, we're able to count spots. And for autophagy, we're starting to look at spot parameters. So we see the, uh, the presence of spots in maximal treated or the absence in minimum treated. We can go through and actually all of the data is already present as you acquire. And so you can look at multiple different par parameters during the acquisition. Here we're just looking at ring spot area in the minimum and maximum treated. These are averages from the wells, but because all of the data is contained within those data sets, 
we can go back in and actually mine the responses from every single cell within that well. And you can see the heterogeneity there. Some of those cells with the one micromolar baphylomycin do not respond at all. And even in the presence of 0.1 cell micromolar baphylomycin, some cells do respond. So this starts to get to some of the robust data sets that you're able to acquire with high content imaging analysis because you're able to sample several thousand cells and really get a good view of that heterogeneity. We can look at multiple parameters. So here we're just counting the, the accumulation of, of, of ring spots during the uh, treatment of cells with baphylomycin A1. This causes the accumulation of LC3B positive autophagosomes within the cell as a function of concentration. We can look at the area, which I previously showed you. Uh, we can also look at the intensity. I'm just going to highlight area for a moment and show you you don't just have to be you don't just have to pull out individual cell information from min and max we can actually pull it out for dose response curves as well so here's the data from every single cell ring spot area is the parameter pulled out for that dose response curve we can also plot it as a 95th and 5th percentile function as well again we start to see the spread of those populations of course we're generally shifting them towards having a larger spot area as a function of concentration but we can see that heterogeneity this is an example using spot counts uh, I can also point you to this reference in the literature. It's a paper from Lance Taylor's group at Pitt. Um, they're looking at the heterogeneity of STAT-3 phosphorylation, uh, also using high content imaging and analysis. And it's a very nice piece that illustrates how we're able to see this heterogeneous response using high content imaging analysis and further states the import importance of this uh, when doing biological research. We don't just have to count spots, of course. Here's an example using nuclear translocation. We're looking at the nuclear translocation of NF-kappa-B in response to TNF-alpha treatment. Um, the, the software builds up a picture of what cells are, are truly cells. We then segment a ring to cover the cytoplasm, and then we look at the intensity ratio between the nucleus and the cytoplasm to read out nuclear translocation. Here, the, the, the six different colors represent the six replicates across that plate. And of course, we're sampling several hundred cells per replicate, so we're getting several thousand cells total per concentration. So very statistically robust data sets that we're able to produce. In addition to nuclear translocational spots, we can also look at fibers. Here's an example of a fiber application using cytoskeletal organization. We've labeled these cells with an alexafluorophylloidin uh, and treated them with cytochalasin D, which disrupts the actin cytoskeleton. A low concentration on the left, uh, we can see has very little effect, and so we can still see the presence of fibers within these cells. However, at higher concentrations, you see the collapse of the cytoskeleton um, as, a as the actin microfibers fall apart. We can use the software to, to take a number of different readings. We can look at the number of fibers within the cells, and we see that fall as a function of increasing cytochalase in D concentration, which is what we'd expect. We're dis um, dis disassembling these fibers. We can also look at the mean fiber intensity, and so here we're able to see those condensation of the fibers into the small spots being read out as an increase in the intensity. So very, very flexible software, able to read out a lot of different parameters within the cell. So for the second part of the uh, presentation, we're going to look at a few applications of high content imaging and analysis. Uh, we showed you these early, but I'll just summarize which ones we're going to address today. We'll look at how we can use high content imaging and analysis with cells that have been modified with CRISPR and Cas9 genome editing. We can look at some applications of neuronal differentiation. We can look at the use of antibody drug conjugates and their readout with high content. We can look at proliferation uh, within populations of cells and all the things that we might want to use proliferation for. Uh, and then finally, we'll show an example of a screening application where we've looked at an siRNA library. So profiling cells that have had their genomes edited with CRISPR-Cas9 technology. So here we're essentially looking at cell profiling. And if you look at profiling cells, uh, we can break this into two categories. Is it a targeted uh, screen or is it a phenotypic screen? So what do we mean by targeted or phenotypic screening? Well, target has a specific molecule in mind. For example, if we're looking at DNA damage, we might look at the, uh, the double-stranded break response here, which is sensed by ATM and subsequent molecules, and leads to phosphorylation of histone H2AX, often referred to as gamma-phoso-H2AX. Uh, gamma Here we'd be looking at the effect of two different compounds on the phosphorylation of this molecule, and we're reading it out with the percent responders. Here this is a very targeted screening application. We know the exact protein modification we're interested in. However, we may want to take a more phenotypic approach. So when we think about phenotypic screens, 
we're looking at really a behavior associated with uh, a cell under certain treatments. So if we were using neurons, for example, we might look at excitability. This is an example using our fluovolt, a new membrane potential dye that was developed by us. Uh, here we can see in blue cells that are not excitable versus uh, a cell in red which is. So this would be an example of a phenotypic output, excitability or non-excitability. When we start to think about CRISPR-Cas9 editing, if you were to use this genome editing approach, of course you would probably sequence to confirm that the editing event has occurred. If you were knocking out a gene, you'd also blot for the protein to confirm the protein has been lost. But it is very important to do the accompanying cellular assays. Uh, and to highlight this, we're going to show you examples of targeted um, phenotypic screen, sorry, a targeted screen, and as well as a primary phenotypic screen, as well as a secondary or tertiary phenotypic screen. Basically, primary phenotypic screens are very close to the process of interest, whereas secondary or tertiary may be further away. Uh, again, I'm going to go back to one of my favorite uh, parts of biology, autophagy, and show you an example of this application using ATG5 edited cells. Here we've made an eight base pair deletion uh, in exon 2 on chromosome 6, and we've lost the protein ATG5. ATG5 is uh, a very important protein in the process of autophagy. Uh, it's part of the ATG5-12-16 complex, which conjugates uh, the LC3B that's been conjugated to phosphatidinyl ethanolamine, uh, becoming associated with the autophagosomal membrane. In cells lacking auto uh, ATG5, they're not able to carry out macroautophagy. So using the targeted assay, we use the, our, our, uh, our antibody LC3B, which picks up the formation of autophagosomes. We do two different drug treatments. We use chloroquine. This works in a similar manner to baflomycin A1. It neutralizes lysosomes, so it causes the accumulation of autolysosomes within cells. We can also stimulate autophagy with a rapalog. Uh, here we're using PP242. This inhibits mTOR and so stimulates autophagy. And if you use these two compounds together, you get an additive effect. So chloroquine causes the accumulation of autolysosomes and PP242 causes the stimulation of autophagy. So together, you get even more spots. Here we're looking at uh, ring spot count. So we're just counting the number of autophagosomes within the cell. And we have wild type cells. These are a haploid cell line, uh, as well as ATG5 knockout, where we've knocked out ATG5. And what we can see is that uh, neither chloroquine, nor PP242, nor the addition of both together cause a significant increase in the number of LC3B spots in the knockout cells uh, compared to vehicle treated. Whereas in wild type, we see a significant increase under all three conditions. So from this, we conclude, conclude that the um, the targeted assay has been successful. We've confirmed that macroautophagy is lost under these conditions, so we have a good model, uh, cellular model, to study autophagy. We can then take uh, a step back but do a proximal assay. So one of the functions of macroautophagy is the clearance of long-lived proteins. Here we're using another click assay. This uses homoproprogyl glycine, HPG. This is a methionine analog, so one can think of it as being analogous to an S35 methionine pulse. Uh, if we incubate cells in the presence of HPG uh, and then chase out for long periods of time, typically between 24 to 48 hours, we're able to look at those, the clearance of those proteins via macroautophagy uh, using the readout from the Alexafluor 488 click signal. We use chloroquine to block the, the, the long-lived protein degradation and we can see that actually these cells, despite lacking macroautophagy, uh, have been able to compensate rather well and are able to clear long-lived proteins just as well as their wild-type match. Interestingly, we can also look at the change in lysosomal mass. Uh, one thing to note is with these haploid cells, we have very little lysosomal staining at rest. Uh, that lysosomal staining increases upon blockade of um, macroautophagy with chloroquine, uh, which disrupts lysosomal function. The increase in lysosomal mass is, is a well-known phenomenon. However, the increase is slightly lower in the knockout cells than in the wild type. So here are a few examples of using high content imaging to do a proximal phenotypic assay. We can also take a step back and do a more distal assay. So these cells have lost ATG5 and have uh, shown impaired ability to induce macroautophagy. We can then look at other cellular processes. Here we're using a new click assay. It's click opropargyl puromycin or OPP. This is a protein synthesis assay. Um, OPP is a click modified pyromycin molecule. Pyromycin resembles an amino satellite transfer RNA, and so if cells are synthesizing protein, they'll incorporate the OPP, we then fix, permeabilize the cells, do a click reaction to attach an Alexafluor 488 to the OPP, and now as a function of um, Alexafluor 488 fluorescence, we can tell how much protein synthesis is occurring in these cells. 
Now, if cells lost the ability to clear proteins or had any impairment in their ability, it might shut down protein synthesis or at least reduce it. However, we can see with the wild type and the knockout, there's no significant difference in the protein synthesis between the wild type and the knockout cells. So this is an example of a more distal phenotypic assay. We can look, look at other related events. So uh, macrotophagy is a primarily pro-survival mechanism. And so one could hypothesize that if you were to lose macrotophagy, maybe you might predispose these cells uh, to cell death following cytotoxic stresses. Here we have a uh, dose response of uh, starosporin, which induces apoptosis. We read out the, the induction of apoptosis with our fluorogenic apoptotic probe, cell event CASB37. Um, this contains uh, a nucleic acid binding dye attached to DVD. When CASB37 is activated, it will cleave that uh, DVD consensus sequence, leaving the DNA dye free to bind to nucleic acids. And so it becomes fluorescent, and the signal increases as apoptosis is induced. What you can see is there's no significant difference between the induction of apoptosis in wild type or knockout cells. So these cells have been able to compensate for a loss of a pro-survival mechanism and they're not more prone to, uh, to die following cytotoxic stress. You can look at even, uh, even more distal processes, just proliferation itself. Are these cells stressed? Have they stopped proliferating? Are they exited the cell cycle? This uses our clicked EDU assay that I'll show in a few slides along. But essentially what we see here is there's no difference in the proliferative index between the wild type and the knockout cells. And so we can say that although we've been able to very surgically edit these cells' genomes and impair macroautophagy, they aren't showing any impaired proliferative index. So let's uh, look at the use of high content imaging in neuronal differentiation. One place which high content imaging is especially important is actually QCing the cells themselves. The use of pluripotent stem cells is, uh, is a very good way of getting uh, more relevant or disease relevant uh, primary neurons for various models of human diseases. And so what we can do is we can use high content imaging to actually QC and look for markers of various stages of differentiation from that pluripotent stem cell phase to mature neurons. Uh, how we're doing this here, we're actually using some off-the-shelf kits. We're using our dopaminergic neuron differentiation kit. We're use, also using our neuron immunized cytochemistry kit, as well as uh, our essential eight media, uh, which is uh, used in stem cell cultures. And then we're actually doing the cell identification itself with our CX5 high content screening platform. So when we take those pluripotent stem cells, the first phase uh, in which they undergo is the formation of these floor plate progenitor cells, or FPPs. These are the precursor of mature dopaminergic neurons. And we look for two markers, FOXA2 and uh, OTX2. We use target identification or um, activation modules to look for the presence of these markers, and we're able to, in a very high throughput and objective manner, quantify how many cells within that stem cell population have become floor plate, floor plate progenitor cells. Following the formation of floor plate progenitor cells, we're able to then differentiate these cells into mature dopaminergic neurons. And here we're looking with the same target activation modules for the presence or absence of tyrosine hydroxylase, indicated here with TH, as a marker that the cells are fully mature dopaminergic neurons. So again, we're doing this in a very high throughput manner, in a very objective uh, way. I'm now going to show you some data using antibody drug conjugates. So why do we use antibody drug conjugates? Well, the way of very precisely bringing uh, toxic agents to specific cell types. Uh, an example is in cancer, where a certain extracellular epitope is able to be recognized by a therapeutic antibody. And to do that, it brings in uh, an, um, an anti-cancer agent, which then kills the tumor. Oftentimes, those agents are endocytosed and trafficked to the lysosome. Within the lysosome, the toxin can then be activated and is released out of the lysosome and free to act. And they're often microtubule disrupting agents, they inhibit mitotic exit, which causes the downstream activation of apoptosis. The example I'm going to show you today uses a, a new technology that we've developed called CyclIC. It's a way of site-specifically modifying antibodies, and in this case, a therapeutic antibody, Herceptin. The sugar molecules on the conserved region are, are azido-modified, and then using a strained alkyne, a dibo molecule, we're able to, in a very controlled and site-specific manner, label these antibodies. We can label them with dyes and we can label them with toxins. And indeed, we can do a bifunctional label where we put a dye and a toxin on. And indeed, that's the example I'm going to show you today. 
Herceptin is able to bind to HER2 positive tumors, and these, uh, these are breast cancer tumors. And on the top here, we have a HER2 positive cell line, the SKBR3s. And on the bottom, we have uh, MDA and B231. These are HER2 negative. The Herceptin here has been labeled with the fluorescent reporter, Alexa 647, as well as the microtubule disrupting agent, MMAE. So we can image them and we can see that uh, Herceptin is only binding to HER2 positive cells, but not HER2 negative. We can then look at the internalization as a function of antibody concentration. And uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, the, the higher the concentration of antibody, the more antibody we see internalizing within the cells. Because we're using fluorescence, we can do multiplex analysis and we're able to look at the subsequent downstream activation of caspases. Here we're using uh, Celevin caspase 37 detection reagent and we can see the, the induction of apoptosis following treatment of these cells with Herceptin MMAE. Of course, this response, both internalization and induction of apoptosis, is missing from the HER2 negative cells, confirming the specificity of this labeling approach. So proliferation. I've shown you a little bit of data using clicked edu before, but just to go into how this actually works. The thymol d-uridine is a thymidine analog, and so cell synthesizing DNA will incorporate edu in the place of thymidine, uh, and then following uh, labeling, we fix, permeabilize, and then um, subject the cells to a click reaction, and here we can label those cells with the dye and tell which ones are in S phase. Here we have an example of our Gibco primary dermal fibroblast cells labeled with edu and counterstained with antitubulin. The EDU is pseudocolored orange, and we can see all those cells with an orange nuclei are ones that are proliferating. We can show that this is specific. For example, we're able to knock out uh, kinesin molecular motor. The KIF11 is involved in mitotic exit. If we knock this down using RNAi, we're able to uh, impair the incorporation of EDU because we're getting fewer cells able to exit mitosis and then enter S phase afterwards. So again, this is a specific label for proliferation. We do use a very useful tool here. We're just showing a dose response curve with Taxol, a well-known microtubule disrupting agent. It stabilizes microtubules, blocks mitotic exit, and as we'd expect with higher and higher concentrations, we get fewer and fewer cells exiting mitosis, and so fewer and fewer are able to incorporate uh, EDU uh, as they enter S phase. This is very important for things like cancer therapies where we're looking at uh, blocking proliferation, but we can use proliferation for a number of other readouts as well. We can use it as the base to start building a more in-depth picture of a population of cells. So here we have S phase cells, as well as a marker for G2N presence. Here we're using phosphorylated histone 3 as a marker of uh, cells that are in G2N. And what we can do is start to build up almost flow cytometry type plots of cellular populations, again, because we're sampling thousands upon thousands of cells. We can do a number of different drug treatments. Uh, Finicolin that blocks the cells in G1S, or Lacotazole that blocks them in G2N. We can start to gate and show cells that are in G1 phase, those that are in S phase, those that are in G2, and those that are G1S blocked, or those that are G2N blocked. So again, these are plots that you'd likely see in flow cytometry, but now we're able to read out markers that uh, depend on their spatial localization. We can also use proliferation as a sensitive readout for prelethal toxicity. Uh, what we'll do here is pair um, our clicked edu technology with markers of viability. So how these work are living cells are not, uh, are not permeable to, to um, nucleic acid dyes that can't cross the plasma membrane. This is because the plasma membrane is intact in living cells. Those cells will also have a certain proliferative index, and so they will have a certain number of cells that are labeling up positive for clicked EDU. However, if cells are dead, they won't be proliferating, and they will now be able to be labeled with these impermeable nucleic acid dyes. I show you an example here using our viability marker image at dead green, as well as click it plus EDU Alexafluor 647. We use camptothecin, a cytotoxic agent, and we use um, a, a low dose, about three micromolar, and a high dose. Now, both of these concentrations would cause significant cell death, which would be read out with a high readout from the image at dead green if we were to incubate for long periods of time. However, this is a very short incubation period, about 30 minutes to 45 minutes. And what we're actually seeing here is although the cells haven't had much time to die, you can see there's very, very few dead cells, no difference between their 3 and 10 micromolar. But what you can see is there's a very robust shutdown of proliferation. And this is a readout of prelethal toxicity. The cells haven't died, however, they're telling us that all is not well. 
But you can also combine uh, proliferative assays such as ClickEdu with reporters of upstream signaling. This is an example using a, a GFP stable line. This expresses um, a GFP chimera of the fork head transcription factor. Fork head transcription factor translocates to the nucleus and regulates cell cycle progression. So now we can look at the cytoplasmic or nuclear localization of the GFP, along with the presence or absence of EDU incorporation. Fork head nuclear translocation is dependent on PI3 kinase signaling. Uh, we can use low or high doses of Wartmanin, a PI3 kinase inhibitor, for either a relatively short incubation period of an hour up top, or a longer overnight treatment for 24 hours along the bottom panel. We can look at the differences or the loss of nuclear translocation with Wartman in treatment. We can also look at changes in proliferative index as we start to uh, affect signaling pathways that regulate proliferation. So finally, we're going to show an application uh, of screening. An example we'll show is an siRNA library. A few notes about library screening. These generally um, will involve a lot of different molecules or compounds or, or genes. And so for this, you'll require multiple plates probably to cover the library. Uh, as I say, they can be a small molecule library, uh, pharmacologically active compounds, or they can be genes with things like sRNA, shRNA, or, or indeed CRISPR libraries. Plate automation can really help here to handle those plates, not only in the labeling, but also in feeding them into the system. Uh, so things like our Orbiter microplate mover, particularly useful to get those plates into the machine, scan them back out. Uh, we use a barcode technology so the machine can actually recognize what plate is what and we can line up plate IDs with compound IDs. So with this siRNA library, uh, we have siRNA against every kinase in the genome, so a kinome. Uh, we're looking at a phenotypic assay here, which is cytoskeletal rearrangement. So our software is able to segment the cells, look at nuclear size as well as cytoplasmic area able to accurately segment the F-actin cytoskeleton as well as the microtubular cytoskeleton. And what we're doing here is looking at changes and disruption of the cytoskeleton. We're actually able to group these into conserved responses. We can look at which genes pr produce the same response of the cytoskeleton. And from that, we can do a cluster analysis and annotate conserved responses with different genes. So we can start to tease out where these, these genes may be acting in certain cellular pathways and how those impinge on the cytoskeleton. So just to finish off, I'm going to bring it all together and show you how we uh, can provide you with all of the components of a successful high content imaging and analysis experiment. Within our software, we have a number of predetermined assays that allow you to do out of the box high content uh, imaging and analysis experiments, as well as ability to build your own or just acquire only and come back and scan later. We also have web-based resources that will point you towards the right reagents to use for a number of different biological assay areas, so we're able to provide support not only in the software and hardware, as well as the reagents. And we have a number of online tutorials that will actually help you understand the fundamentals of fluorescence, which will further enhance your assay using high content imaging and analysis. We do have a number of high content systems uh, available. We have our um, entry system, the bench level CX-5. We have our brand new CX-7. Uh, this contains laser autofocus as well as seven channel detection, as well as a ray scan um, HCS system. This is uh, a very flexible system that can be equipped with live cell chambers, kinetic imaging, liquid handling, as well as confocal units, which are present on the CX-7 system as well. In addition to our high content systems, we also have other accompanying instrumentation, such as our Countess cell counter, uh, one aspect that I wasn't able to go into in a lot of detail is the, the importance of getting good plating densities when doing your assays, and so using uh, systems such as the Countess are absolutely imperative to make sure that you're plating at the right density, as well as our, our line of benchtop fluorescence microscopes, which can allow you to do quick QC checks, or indeed in the case of our FL Auto, fully automated plate scans as well. So hopefully today I've shown you what high content imaging and analysis really is. Uh, I hope I've shown you a few compelling reasons as to why you should consider incorporating high content imaging and analysis into your experimental workflow. I've uh, shown you a few examples of the use of high content imaging analysis, as well as just summarized a complete offering available from Firma Fisher Scientific uh, with respect to high content imaging and analysis. So with that, thank you very much for uh, attending today's webinar, and I hope you found it useful, and we'll open it up for questions.
Thank you, Dr. Dolman, for bringing that important information to us. Excellent presentation. It's time for our Q&A, as you said. If you have a question you'd like to do so, please ask it now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and hit the send button. We'll answer as many of your questions today as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question, you showed a segmentation of nuclei and the cellular area, but how can you segment live cells? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. Um, primarily, the tools I showed you today were for, for, for fixed cells, so our cell mask tools are only able to, to work in fixed cells. Um, certain nucleic acid dyes, such as Hertz 33342, are permeable to living cells, and so they're a useful tool for nuclear segmentation in living cells. If you were to try and segment, uh, for example, cytoplasmic regions within living cells, um, you can use dyes such as our cell tracker, um, cell tracker green, cell tracker orange, as well as a brand new cell tracker, cell tracker deep red. Uh, and these um, are able to, to give you good demarcation of the entire cytoplasmic area of a cell. Great, thank you. We do have another question for you, Dr. Dolman. An attendee asks, do you have anything for segmenting the plasma membrane? Oh yeah, another segmentation question. Yeah, um, we do. Uh, we have uh, some tools called cell mask plasma membrane labels. Um, they're able to, to label the plasma membrane. We have a green, an orange, and a deep red, so uh, probes emitting in the FITSI GFP range, the, the, the TRITSI Psi 3, as well as the, the Psi 5 part of the spectrum. Um, these are actually labeled, uh, you use them to label live cells, um, however, it's, uh, they only are, they're, they're internalized fairly rapidly, and so you have a relatively short window to image the plasma membrane, so we do recommend fixing the cells uh, to, to maintain the fidelity of the plasma membrane level. And unfortunately, they, they do not withstand um, permeabilization with detergents, and so they're not compatible with antibody staining. Okay, we do have another question. In addition to spots and fibers, what other structures can be recognized for analysis? Okay, yeah, um, we, we tried to show you the main areas uh, during today's webinar, which is essentially spots, fibers, or indeed um, looking at translocation from the cytoplasm in the nucleus. Uh, fibers are a little bit of, a, of an exception, although they are built out in the software from the same basic principles. But spots really can be used to, to segment any different structure. Um, obviously, things like autophagosomes and endosomes and lysosomes are fairly circular, and so they, they can be called sort of spots. Um, however, if you think about looking at protein aggregates or indeed mitochondria, things that aren't truly circular, we're still using the same spot function, it's just they won't be truly circular. So essentially, picking up any event within a cell of any known distribution or, or orientation or, or, or dimensions really will use those circles that, for the nucleus, the ring for the cytoplasm, and then using a spot type function to pick it up. So, Although we, we really just referred to more circular spots, uh, you're able to do a number of different assays using um, spot algorithms that are slightly elongated in one axis or another. Okay, thank you. I'm afraid that is all the time we have now for our questions. I just wanna pass it back to Dr. Dolman to see if he has any final comments or suggestions, advice for our audience today. I'd just like to thank you all for, for attending today's webinar and I do hope you found it useful. If you do need additional information, you can find it on thermofisher.com forward slash HCS. 
uh, all of the information we covered here is available there, as well as a lot more information on our systems and reagents. Thank you, Nick. Excellent presentation today. Thank you for bringing that information to us and taking time to be with us today here. I also want to thank our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December of 2016. You'll be receiving an email from LabRoots to let you know when this webcast is available for replay, and we would invite you to share that email with any colleagues who might have missed today's live broadcast. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope we see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>